Welcome to Modern Medicine. I'm Dr. Dave Moylan, Medical Director of the Simon Kramer Cancer Institute, and I'm pleased to have two special guests today that are going to enlighten us about one aspect of medicine that I have to confess may have been neglected in medical school. That is nutrition and health. I think I might have had two, four lectures on nutrition over the four years of medical school where the didactic uh, sessions are given. And diet, obviously, to any practitioner of medicine is critically important to uh, health. And I'm uh, pleased to have with us today Mr. Ed Esco and his fiance, Naomi Ishikawa from uh, Tokyo. Ed, Naomi, welcome to Modern Medicine. Thank you, Dr. Moylan. It's our pleasure to be here. Well, I'm, before we go into further introductions, I want to tell our audience, the viewers, how I became interested in the macrobiotic diet, and you'll tell us all about that. But when I was training at some, uh, Thomas uh, Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia in the early 1980s, well, it was a celebrated case. There was a doctor and his name was Anthony Satellaro. And this is one of two books that he did write. And uh, he was the medical director. He was a physician. He had studied anesthesiology, which he practiced for many years. But then he went on to become the president of the Methodist Hospital in South Philly. And uh, he contracted a dread disease, prostate cancer. And unfortunately, back in those days, before we had the early warning system of the PSA level, doctor uh, had stage four disease, which meant it was in his bones from the get-go. And he was young also. Uh, yes, and you can tell that from his photograph here. But uh, he took the standard treatment back in those days, and still to this uh, very day, uh, removal of testosterone from the body. And that was accomplished in those days by a me medical surgical procedure called orchiectomy. And that worked quite well. In fact, the doctor that described how prostate cancer was related to the, the male hormone, uh, Dr. Huggins from the University of Chicago, he got the Nobel Prize for that uh -huh. discovery. But unfortunately, uh, very shortly after the surgical procedure, the cells become resistant to that and the disease recurs and progresses. And uh, so Dr. Satellaro had a life expectancy of about three years. And as you point out, as a young man, that didn't appeal to him. So he researched uh, this diet, and I'm gonna turn it over to you because you uh, know some of the details of his case. Um, yes, that, the Dr. Satellaro was a Western trained physician Western scientifically trained, and so had never really investigated the role of diet or the role of various holistic approaches to illness, let alone to cancer. And the way he discovered macrobiotics was by chance. He had just finished um, his father's funeral. His father had passed away. And he had had his diagnosis of metastatic prostate cancer, which was fatal. Yeah, indeed. And he was coming home from his father's funeral, believe it or not. And he picked up two hitchhikers, which he never would have done before. Yeah. But he was in such a disoriented frame of mind, he went out of character. Yeah. On the New Jersey Turnpike. And they turned out to be two young students from the East West Foundation and the Macrobiotic Restaurant in Boston, who were on their way to North Carolina on vacation. And they had been exposed to our East West Foundation, that was Michio Kushi and myself actually mm -hmm. started, the program called Nutritional Approach and Dietary Approach to Cancer which began around 1976, 1977, and in which we held in the Boston area symposia 
and conferences dedicated to that theme. And we invited leading the nutritional professors from Harvard, from Tufts, from other regional the medical centers to participate. Together with people like Sadalaro, who actually, we called them our testimonials, our case histories, including pancreatic cancer, people who had recovered uh, miraculously, so to speak, using the macrobiotic diet. So those case people presented their stories. The medical people presented their point of view, which was at that point beginning to acknowledge the relation between diet and degenerative disease. Maybe you know, remember 1976, 77, the McGovern Committee, U.S. Senate Committee in Washington, D.C., Dietary Goals for the United States. Do you remember that? Advocating reduction in meat, reduction in processed food, and advocating the diet based on grain, vegetables, soy foods, etc., which was essentially the macrobiotic diet. We were very happy. And the Harvard Medical School had a pivotal role in testimony, which led to that adoption of those so-called dietary guidelines. So that was in the atmosphere at that time. So we, from our conferences, we published small reports and circulated those. And these two boys the, who were hitchhiking yes. knew all this. So anyway, they got into Sotolaro's car on the Jersey Turnpike. And he was depressed, needless right. to say. And so they were saying, how are you? Everything OK? Right? Fine weather today? And he was very depressed. They said, what's wrong? And he told them, I just buried my father. And I've been diagnosed with terminal cancer. I have six months to live. And then one of them looked at him and said, Doc, I'm a doctor, he said. The boy looked at him and said, Doc, you don't have to die. There's something called macrobiotics. OK? And please contact the Boston, our East West Foundation, and they can send you some information. And Sadalar did what he would never do before, kind of a wing and a prayer. Yeah. He contacted, he called. Desperation. And so our office sent out our report, which was a transcript of that conference, cancer conference. With the Harvard professors. Yeah, and, and other professors. people from, there was a, a physician from Philadelphia, in fact, who testified. She had recovered also from cancer. So he read that. And their contact information was there at the end. So he called that uh, Philadelphia doctor, a lady doctor. And she encouraged him, yes, by all means, check it out. Try it. You have nothing to lose. Yeah. So he, being from Philadelphia, contacted our East-West Center, our East-West Foundation office. We had satellite offices in the Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington at that time. Contacted our friends in Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, at that time, it was uh, a man named Denny Waxman, who yes. still has a school in Philadelphia. Yes, indeed. And his wife at that time was Judy Waxman. So they gave him preliminary guidelines, preliminary consultation and advice. Uh, Judy cooked meals for him. And um, miraculously, I guess, um, he began to recover. Eventually, he came up to Boston and saw Michio Kushi directly. And I saw his scans. His scans were published in Life magazine. The before scans, like you said, all over the spine. We'd say it was re lighting up like a Christmas tree. The pelvis, all metastasized. OK, and then nine months, 12 months later, another bone scan, clean. So in Life magazine, you had the first before and then the after. And the fact that he was president of a hospital, he had you know, ironclad yeah. backup that he actually did have cancer. There was no question. And that he also had no cancer after yes. the practicing macrobiotics. So this case was covered in the Saturday Evening Post, which at that time was a big magazine, yeah, Life magazine. His book, first book, was Recalled by Life, which I helped uh, put him together with Tom Monty, who was the author of that book. Yeah. And that sold like crazy. It was translated into yeah. at least 15 languages. I'd have to say it's still available, as is this book, Living Well Naturally, on 
Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. yeah. yeah. It, was, it was in both hardcover and paperback. So it became sensational. So at the time that he went really public and high profile, our East West Foundation office started getting letters. Yeah. One point up to 35,000 letters came. In those days, that's before email. So letters came, and we couldn't just email them back. We had to send them out. Yeah. The printed material, postage. In fact, nice Michio Kushi was very concerned it would bankrupt the East West Foundation <laughs> just re res <coughs> responding to this. Yeah, postage. And printing and all that in those days. There was no email. Well, that, that's a wonderful introduction to the concept. But uh, now can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? I'm from Philadelphia originally. And in the late 1960s, I was a student of yoga. In fact, I studied in Germantown, small studio, with a teacher named Yogi Desai. Desai. Uh, Amrit Desai. And it was only about a dozen of us in a small class. He later went on to found Kripalu, this perhaps the largest yoga center in the country, which is actually now in Lenox, Mass., not far from we, where we are, in yes. the Berkshires. Gigantic yoga center. And it was through my interest in initially yoga, yogic breathing, Zen, Buddhism, Buddhism in general, uh, Taoism, which is Chinese, the, the, the traditional philosophy. From interest in Far Eastern philosophy, I discovered the so-called Zen macrobiotics, and realize this is the way to put into practice um, these so-called spiritual practices and spiritual teachings, to actualize that. And at that time, I was the typical American diet, and I quit. I resigned from hamburgers. I resigned from milkshakes. I resigned from hoagies. I resigned from those delicious foot-long Philadelphia cheesesteaks down in, on, in the center city. Pats. <laughs> and started eating brown rice. I was still living with my parents. And my mother was a good cook, you know, t typical Betty Crocker. Well, and I can 60. tell you, you were from Philadelphia. You called them hoagies, hoagies. rather than submarines. Yeah, yeah, hoagies, or, right? Or, or grinders I thought or whatever. the listeners would relate to hoagies, yeah. I think. Well, I think at this point we're going to take a commercial break. And then we're going to get back to uh, hear your amazing story mm -hmm. now. Okay. okay. Welcome back to Modern Medicine. And I'm so pleased to have with us two very special guests from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, who are talking to us about the macrobiotic, not just diet, but approach to health. Mm. Mr. Ed Esco and his fiance, Naomi Ishikawa. Um, Ed, you were telling us about your Philadelphia roots. Yeah, so um, I got the copy of Zen Macrobiotics and started cooking brown rice in my parents' home in Northeast Philadelphia. My mother was a good cook, but now I became very, the what? For example, like her refrigerator, all beautiful supermarket foods, the usual American foods. Whereas before, we were enjoying very much. Now, with macrobiotics, everything became bad. That's not good, that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> so this created a rift yeah. between my mm -hmm. parents and me. Good humor rift. But uh, you weren't going macrobiotic for health uh, reasons. Spiritual reasons. Spiritual reasons, yeah. And it was a, at that time what we called a rice fast, a 10-day rice fast, so a very extreme version of macrobiotics, temporary version. So as part of that, so that created a little bit of friction. My father was kind of like the ward cleaver in Leave it to Be. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that was the first thing. Then second thing, we had twig tea. You know, bancha, yes. kukicha, mm -hmm. twig tea. And in those days, it was recommended we roast it in a skillet, dry roast it, to make it more concentrated. Yeah. So here I was in my mother's kitchen roasting the leaves, the twigs, yeah. not knowing at all what I was doing. Yeah. I burnt them. Smoke filled the entire kitchen. So at that time, my father, like Ward Cleaver, came in like this, yeah. kind of shaking his head. We tolerated the Rolling Stones. 
We tolerated Woodstock. We are not tolerating this. So at that point, like a wandering monk, I packed up my brown rice, I packed up my copy of Zen Macrobotics, and then went on the spiritual quest. Yeah. That's why I left home. Encountering many teachers, many masters, right? Moving to Boston. I'm sure your mom studying. said, pretty rough on the beaver last night, aren't you? <laughs> anyway, she, yeah. the, they, over the years, they didn't understand at all what we were doing. But over the years, seeing their grandchildren, healthy macrobiotic grandchildren, and seeing the valuable work that we did, and seeing over time the positions we had at that time in the 70s, mm -hmm. which were radical, diet and cancer are connected, diet and heart disease are connected, seeing those positions echoed by Harvard School of Public Health, by all the leading public health agencies here and around the world, they started to see maybe what they were saying wasn't nonsense coming from our son, yeah. but was valid. And they themselves made big improvements in their diet. And uh, my mother's now close to 90 years old. Is that old right? And well, still quite God strong. bless her. Yeah. yeah. She's the semi-macrobiotic at this point. Well, of course, um, at that age, you don't argue. You just whatever they want. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I visited the Cushy Institute in uh, Beckett, Massachusetts, uh, probably a half dozen times over the last uh, six or seven years. I've found personal health benefits there. I'm a work in progress, a long way to go. But one of my concerns was uh, weight. Uh, Naomi, you've uh, fought that battle, I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about your experience? Yep. Uh, actually, I was struggling my kind of obesity condition from my teenager to, I think, 30s, my 30s. So always I'm eating McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, chocolate, kind of things is my, was my diet. But my friend saw my condition. It's really no good. So maybe you should try to eat brown rice. She recommended me to eat brown rice. I didn't know anything about macrobiotic at that Were time. Were you living in uh, Tokyo at yeah, the time? Yeah, I live in Tokyo. They yeah. have Kentucky Fried in oh, Tokyo. Of course, oh, everywhere. Every year. Japan, yeah. So <laughs> it has you. Yeah. yeah. And then, okay, anyway, I don't change it, not so everything. But anyway, I will try to eat brown rice. And then I start to eat brown rice instead of hamburger. So even just eating start brown rice makes my condition big change. I feel like uh, more energetic and then also I don't feel not much fatigue. What's going on in my body, I was thinking. And then after that, I'm looking for internet, brown rice diet or things. So Kushi Institute show up. Yes. And then, oh, maybe I have to study these things seriously. And then quickly I decided to go to US to study macrobiotic. And then I went to Kushi Institute for three months to study whole session for uh, to be macrobiotic instructor. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I ate every day macrobiotic during three months without any McDonald's, chocolate, anything. And then three months, I totally changed. You know, like uh, I have so much pim uh, what's it say? Pim pimple in acne. my yeah, acne yeah. or the things, <coughs> gone. And then I lose weight, of course. And then when I was eating too much chocolate or junk food, I was very unstable for my mental. Sometimes I'm very short temperature, you know, but after that, <laughs> I'm always peaceful, stable. Of course, sometimes get angry, but not yeah, so. Now at me, she could say. <laughs> yes, yes, with but, good reason. Yeah. yeah, you know, always like a peaceful, you know. So I got the, these things, and then after I finished my study at the Kushi Institute, I decided to change my whole career. I was working in a restaurant as a restaurant manager, but I quit every the career, and then I start to share my wonderful experience with macrobiotic. I want to help people struggling so many conditions, like not even cancer or diabetes, or not a big disease, like just small bad condition we have, especially women has some trouble for, for example, unstable period, the kind yes. of, you know, and a small, you know, but condition, but this is really we can improve 
from your diet. So I just you know, can show everybody my improvement, very dramatically improvement. I can show everybody. So that's why I start to teach macrobiotic to share my experience. Well, I think what you just uh, touched upon, improvement in acne mm -hmm. and <clears throat> the menstrual cycle, mm -hmm. hormones have to be involved in this yeah. Uh, somehow. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and well, well, would you our, like to add to that? Well, our you know? theory, our theory is that hormones are very sensitive and very the, affected by our diet. So for example, the male hormone testosterone, which you mentioned for prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. That is accelerated in both the male and female bodies by the heavy intake of animal products, including meat, especially meat. So if a woman is eating heavy meat diet, McDonald's, etc., right? She's overproducing male hormone. And naturally, that's going to disrupt her menstrual cycle. I see. So that can be alleviated by eliminating those foods and eating semi-vegan, plant-based macrobiotic diet. And she experienced immediate improvement, as have thousands of women. Well, Naomi, uh, you did have a reduction in your weight, and we'll be able to show the viewers a before-after picture mm -hmm. of you, but could you tell us a little bit more about that, and over what period of time did mm -hmm. you lose the weight? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, I started to study, seriously started macrobiotic, I think, 2010, and then uh, from that, and then maybe seven years, I lose weight, you said 45 pounds? Yeah, yeah I think you, you expressed yeah, I, it in kilograms, yeah, kilogram, but that would be the rough translation. Yeah, 45 pounds. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Little by little, not like a dramatically, but this is very important, you know, if we lose weight just like one month or two months, absolutely something, you know, what to say, side effect coming. Yes. But I take time little by little because my diet is not to eat anything or you know, what to say, like a so hard exercise, not like that extreme. Like every day, just to balance the food, eat, eat three times a day. Yeah. So yes. little by little, I lose weight. And then yeah. now kind of I'm very energetic and I'm very comfortable with my body. Maybe it means I became best yeah. weight and the best shape now. Can I ask you to just stand up so our viewers can take a look at you? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think what she's talking Have about is sustainable weight loss. <laughs> yes. Gradual, sustainable, rather than <clears throat> sudden, drastic. The yo-yo effect. Yeah, and back and forth. She's yeah. sustained that. She hasn't gone back yeah. to eating her previous foods at all. She was very much addicted to chocolate, and now is completely many years off of chocolate permanently. Mm -hmm. so, so sustainability is the issue, I think, with weight loss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm referring back to some... Um, demographic information about breast cancer mm -hmm. and at one time breast cancer was a rarity among Japanese uh, women mm -hmm. but I understand and perhaps it's again related to the change in the diet that that is becoming a problem in uh, Japan also yeah a lot of that can be traced to um, World War II when at that time it was mandated that school children must have so many uh, ounces of milk per day in their diet. Whereas previous to that, the Japanese never drank milk. Never drank dairy milk. Food. Never. Yeah. And also after World War II, sugar, refined sugar started to invade everywhere. Even the white rice in sushi restaurants had sugar. Sugar came in. And then also chemicalized processed food came in. So it was the introduction of those previously unknown foods in the Japanese diet. Together with that, breast cancer started to creep upward, whereas before it was practically unknown. Un unheard of, yeah. yeah. And there were also things in the Japanese diet, traditional diet, that protected, we believe, protected women against breast cancer. Things like tofu, natto, other traditional... Again, define tofu for the tofu uninitiated is viewers. Tofu uh, is kind of what? Aged, slightly aged soy milk into like a cake, something like cheese, right? And natto, which are whole fermented soybeans. These are so-called phytoestrogen rich foods. Plant, plant, plant estrogen. estrogen yeah. Which kick out the bad estrogen or neutralize in the male body 
the excess testosterone. So they have protective effects both for breast cancer and prostate cancer, both of which in Japan are fractional, fractionally lower than our rates here in the United States. Well, uh, Ed, Naomi, we're going to wrap things up for this uh, session, but we have so much to talk about in this uh, very important uh, arena. We're going to bring you back for another session in the very near future. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Sorry.